Welcome everyone once again. I did not have the start the broadcast button on, but I just turned it on. Welcome again, Nancy. Nancy, how are you? I'm well, thank you. How about yourself, Byron? Fine, thanks. Thanks for enduring a, two introductions, everyone. But Nancy, you know, you deserve two introductions, so how about that? <laughs> <Thank you. laughs> So Nancy was uh, one of our, our super popular speakers at, at our content marketing conference this year, and I'm very excited for her to uh, debut this presentation to some folks that are listening in today. We had uh, more than 500 people register for this, so very, very exciting that so many people were interested in this. And uh, per usual, I'll walk everybody through a couple of logistics real fast, and then we'll dive right into Nancy's presentation. Yes, this webinar is being recorded. I can almost guarantee in about 20 minutes from now, I'll get a question. I love getting questions, so do send them along, but someone will say, is this webinar being recorded? But that's probably because they're coming in a few minutes late, and they haven't seen this fabulous screen. So uh, so hats off to everybody for, for living, listening to the live presentation, but you will get a link to the recording. And there are also all of these webinars are available on our website. You can instantly see and listen to the recordings and download the files as well. Um, we're going to send you a link right after this recording, probably tomorrow, although Kelly is speedy fast, so she'll probably get this out by the end of the day or first thing tomorrow for sure. Um, and we love a little Twitter love, as we say, um, using the pound uh, right on, um, as well as uh, at Byron White, everybody knows that, and, and at, at N Harhut. So um, without further ado, everybody sort of knows who I am. I'm the founder of uh, Writer Access. We're very proud to announce that we've made the Inc. 5000 list for three years in a row. Uh, we're coming off a, a exciting uh, summer with some huge changes and excitements that we'll be announcing very soon. I'll give you a sneak peek right now. We have an app coming out which should make all of our, both our, our customer base and writer uh, pool extremely happy. You'll be able to uh, do lots of fun and exciting things orbiting at high speeds, namely uh, approving content and, and, and even uh, managing the whole workflow. That will all be possible with the new app we have coming out, which is very exciting, and that's due out on the first week of November. Uh, we're also sponsoring uh, the uh, B2B conference uh, with, uh, with marketing profs here in Boston uh, next week. Uh, and we're also sponsoring Inbound again. We're a big sponsor of, of, of Inbound, and we look forward to connecting uh, with people there. If anybody's in the Boston area or even thinking about coming to, 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 uh, to Boston, for inbound, we're actually hosting a really big party. I know, Nancy, you're local. You'll certainly get an invitation to that. Um, by the way, Nancy, thank you for joining us on our fabulous boat cruise this year. That was a lot of fun. <laughs> um, so much. Thank you. You bet. Um, and we're having a really interesting party uh, that's uh, sponsored by not only Writer Access, but uh, GoToWebinar as well as SpyFu. Uh, we're teaming up and throwing a big big party at a place called Life is Good. Um, everybody probably knows that famous t-shirt company. The story behind that company is quite interesting as well. They have a, a nonprofit division of their company, <clears throat> which we're making a significant contribution to in exchange for uh, allowing us to host their uh, host a big event at their at their corporate location, which is just a gorgeous, fabulous, dedicated room they've set up for events like this to help them raise funding. Uh, and we're very excited. We're going to have some moth speakers, kind of interesting, um, as well as just a you know open bar and food and fun evening to gather with with uh, friends and customers and, and writers. So do think about coming to Inbound this year uh, for the life is good when your content is great party that worth growing, along with a couple of uh, other great sponsors, as mentioned. Without further ado, um, you all know who I am, but Nancy's going to give a brief introduction to herself uh, and in just a second, and then we'll, uh, we'll come back and, and thank everybody for tuning in to this, uh, this great presentation you're about to hear. So without further ado, Nancy, I'm taking up all of my allocated time, and I'm turning the slate over to you, Ta -da, coming your way, everyone. There you go. Nancy will accept, and off we go. Thanks for tuning in, everyone. All right. Well, uh, thank you, Byron. And uh, hello, everybody, and, and welcome to How to Create Brain Craving Content in Five Easy Steps. I'm so psyched you're here, and I'm happy to be talking to you. So let's get started. Um, first, hmm, for some reason, I can't advance my slides. Well, let's see. If you, if you. 
touch your screen with your mouse and then it will all magically go. work. Yes. Got it. Got it. Got it. Got it, got it. Seven years to learn that. There you go. <laughs> all right. So, um, so, all right, let's get started. How to create brain craving content in five easy steps. First, you need to know a little something about the brain. It doesn't like to work hard. Now, I know, I know, everyone went to a great college, your degree says you're pretty smart, and, you know, you probably think that you make very considered decisions. And the truth of the matter is, you do, sometimes. But the dirty little secret is, a lot of times, the brain likes to take the easy way out. As a matter of fact, I'm going to quote uh, Daniel Kahneman, who's a Nobel Prize winning economist and the author of Thinking Fast and Slow. And he says, the brain doesn't like logical, rational, conscious thinking and will take any sh shortcut it can. So think about that. It will take any shortcut it can. As a result, human beings have developed a number of decision-making shortcuts. These are actions that we perform automatically, instinctively, reflexively. We give them little to no thought. And people, humans, have developed them over the millennia as a way to conserve mental energy because we couldn't possibly weigh every bit of information before making a decision, or we'd never get around to making any. So we default to these hardwired automatic actions to make things easy for us. Think of it this way. If I were to sneeze, you wouldn't say, hmm, Nancy just sneezed. What should I do? Should I say something? Should I not say something? I think I'll say something. What should I say? No, if, if someone sneezes, you say, bless you, or gesundheit, right? You don't think about it, you just respond. And social scientists have documented dozens and dozens of these automatic behaviors. And it turns out that they affect all kinds of decisions, not just what to say when someone sneezes, but they affect decisions like what to read and who to tr trust and whether to take action and when to take action. And that's why it's important that we as content marketers know about them. Now, the other thing you need to know is a little bit about content. And I suspect because you're here, you probably already know a lot about content. And so it's probably not going to surprise you when you hear these stats. There are 4 million Facebook posts every minute, 347,272 tweets every minute, 1,400 new blog posts every minute. And LinkedIn, LinkedIn says 4.6 billion pieces of content are created daily. So what does this all mean? It means that we have a lot of competition. In fact, it's why some of the gurus in content marketing are saying that we should be generating less content. We should focus more on quality, not quantity. Because the truth of the matter is today, it is no longer enough for us to have great information that's on brand and that's grammatically excellent, perfectly produced. In a way, these are table stakes. Okay? It's no longer enough for us to do that. What we have to do to make sure that we write something gets read, that we write something that gets read, is to build in certain automatic actions. Okay, we have to make sure that what we're doing gets consumed, and that it builds preference, and it builds a, a, a preference for action. It prompts action because that's our ultimate goal. So if you think about it, if the content that we're creating needs to create action, and some actions are automatic, wouldn't it be great for us as content marketers to know the triggers that prompt those hardwired automatic actions. And that's what I'd like to share with you today. I'd like to share five ways to create brain craving content, five ways that you can create content that the brain just can't ignore. So here's the first way, step number one. We need to remember that some words count more than others. Some words count more than others. Which words are these? Well, these are words that increase readership, influence the way we absorb information, and incite action. And there are a number of tests that prove this. There's been in-market testing, heat mapping, eye tracking, fMRI machines. All of these prove that there are some words that pull the human eye in. Because when we write, we write in a very linear fashion, right? Think about it. One word followed by the next, followed by the next. But that's not how people read. When people read, they skim and they scan. And what that means is, unless a certain word jumps out and pulls somebody in, they're just not really going to engage. They're going to just keep skimming and scanning. But when a word jumps out and attracts their attention, it pulls them in and it makes them more fully engaged with the content. So we want to know what those words are and we want to use them in, in high-read pieces of real estate. So I want to share at least four of those words with you. The first word is the word new. And here's why new is so powerful. The human brain craves novelty. People are hardwired to look for the next new thing. We're constantly looking for news, for novelty, and there's a reason for that. And the reason is it activates our brain's reward center. Simply put, 
It feels good. It feels good when we find something new. So we're constantly on the lookout for something new. So using the word new is a very good thing to do in your content. And in fact, it's not just the word new. There's a whole family of new words. Introducing, announcing, finally, soon. These are all great words to use in content. Another good power word. Oh, well, wait a minute. Let me, let me expand on new a little bit. There are other ways to talk about the fact that something is new. We could say seven countries you've, never, you've definitely never heard of. Or we could say top 10 scientific discoveries of 2015. We could even say the awesome brunch no one knows about yet. So these are all great ways to, con to convey the notion of novelty and news. So we can actually use the word new or part of the family of new words, new, now, introducing, announcing, family soon, uh, finally soon. Or we can use some of these other ways to convey that we have something that's, that's novel and that's new that someone should pay attention to. All right, the second power word that I want to share with you is the word free. Dan Ariely is a noted behavioral economist. He's a Duke University professor. And he's also the New York Times best-selling author of the book, Predictably Irrational. In that book, Dan devotes an entire chapter to the pulling power of the word free. He explains that when we see the word free, we're automatically drawn to it. He says that free creates such an emotional charge we perceive the free thing to be more valuable than it is. So when we see free, we are drawn to it. So a great thing for us to use in our content marketing. We can say, get our free email course on referral marketing. Here we have a, a free family law rights site with free divorce uh, help. I hope nobody needs that, but still. Uh, here we even have the foolproof way to get free beer. Now, what's interesting is you think, all right, free is a good word. I imagine complimentary probably does the same thing, right? It's its nearest synonym. However, studies show that complimentary is not as effective as the world free. Uh, there's a study called a study from World Data, and they found that free is twice as effective as complimentary. Free just gives us that emotional charge that complimentary doesn't. So good thing to kind of tuck in the back of our minds. All right, our third power word is the word you. And the reason you is so powerful is it triggers the principle of liking. Social scientists talk about the principle of liking, and they explain it this way. People are attracted to things that remind us of ourselves. And so the word you reminds us of ourselves. BI Norwegian School of Business conducted a study, and what they found was self-referencing tweets, tweets that use the word you or your, actually lift readership. So here we're looking at a couple of tweets using the word your, and it's a very good thing. You and your are great words to use. Here we have Khan Academy. They say, you only have one thing to know. You can learn anything. Or even AOL. You have to try this recipe, Cobb Salad Sandwich. So when you're, when you're developing your content, when you're writing, go heavy on the word you and actually pull back and try not to use words like I, we, our, our company. Pull back on those words a little bit. It's, it's impossible to avoid them entirely, but every use of, of you should be probably five times more prevalent than the use of I, we, our company. Because as people are skimming and scanning, I, we, us, our company, those are words that do not pull the human eye in. The word you, the human eye goes right towards it. So keep that in mind. Our final power word is the word secret. Research shows that people find information more persuasive if they believe it's not widely available. And that's why secret is such a compelling word. When we see the word secret, we think, ah, I'm going to get information that not everyone has, that everyone doesn't have access to. It's, it's a very, very powerful motivator. We, we find the information more persuasive and more believable, and we want to get at it. So here we have Forbes' uh, Little Black Book of Billionaire Secrets. It's a book that I'd like to get, actually. Here we have the seven secrets top athletes can teach you about being the best at anything. And we're, we even have an invitation to enter the secret portal and access a decade of proven digital marketing tactics. Now, there are a few other ways to convey that information is not known by all. It's not easily accessible. And one of those ways is to say that it's from an insider. Here we have five platform tips from a Pinterest insider. So we're not really using the word secret, but we're certainly trading on that idea that the information isn't widely available. Similarly, here we have confessions of a, formal pre, a former pre-dental. So if you've got information from someone who's been on the inside, who's, you know, who's seen things that not everyone else gets to see, and then they're going to reveal that information, that is very powerful, and, and people are drawn to it. So those are a handful of words that increase readership, which are important for us as content marketers. But there are other words that actually influence how we absorb information. So let's take a look at a few of those examples. There's a psychologist named Elizabeth Loftus, and she ran a study. 
And in the study, she showed a video of a traffic accident. And what she did in her study is she took people and she divided them into two groups. And she showed both groups the exact same video of the exact same traffic accident. And then she asked one group to estimate how fast the cars were going when they smashed. But she asked the other group to estimate how fast the cars were going when they contacted. Well, the group that was asked how fast the cars were going when they smashed estimated that they were going at 40.8 miles per hour. The other group, when asked how fast were they going when they contacted, estimated 31.8 miles per hour. That's a difference of over 28% due to one single change in verb. The verb made all the difference. There were 28% difference. There was a study that was reported in the Journal of Consumer Research, and it had to do with fruit chews and candy chews. And when people were given a choice, they consumed more fruit chews because they understood them to be healthier, when in fact they were also candy. But the labeling, the name of the item, made all the difference. Now sometimes it's not just the words that we choose, but it's the order that we put them in that can influence how people absorb the information. For example, there was a University of Geneva study, and they asked people, can you smoke while you pray? Can you smoke while you pray? Well, when these people were asked, 96% said no. I guess maybe they thought it was sacrilegious, but 96% said no. You can't smoke while you pray. So University of Geneva simply rephrased the question and asked it this way. Can you pray while you smoke? Well, here, 97% of the people said yes. So the difference between 96% no and 97% yes was dramatic. Now, it was the exact same thing, the two actions happening simultaneously, smoking and praying, praying and smoking. But how the question was phrased made a dramatic difference in the results. And social scientists refer to this as framing. So not only the words that you choose, but the order that you put them in can have a huge impact on how people absorb your information, absorb your content. Now, some words actually incite action. And so we should take a look at a few of those. As a matter of fact, there was a study that came out of Harvard University. And the study's author was Ellen Langer. And she identified the word because as a very important word, as a compliance trigger. So let me tell you about the study. There are a bunch of people that were lined up to use a photocopier. And Langer sent someone to the head of the line, and that person said, excuse me, can I cut in front of you? Well, 60% of the people allowed the person to cut in front. Langer. Uh, repeats the experiment a second time, but this time she sends someone to the head of the line, and this person says, excuse me, can I cut in front of you? Because I'm in a hurry. I have some copies to make. Well, here, 94% of the people said, yeah, you can cut in front of me. And as I tell you the story, you might think, well, Nancy, these people, you know, they said they were in a hurry, and, and that's why uh, the, the people in line let them, uh, let them cut. But Langer repeated the experiment a third and final time, and this time the person went to the head of the line and said, excuse me, uh, do you mind if I cut in front of you? because I have some copies to make. Well, here, 93% of the people said yes. Statistically insignificant difference between 94% and 93%. But think about it. Can I cut in front of you because I have some copies to make? Well, everybody standing in that line was standing in that line because they had some copies to make. They weren't standing there because they wanted a coffee. Dr. Langer identified the word because as a compliance trigger. When we encounter the word because, when we read it, when we hear it, when we see it, we just start to nod yes like a little bobblehead, assuming that whatever comes next is going to be a good, logical, rational reason without even fully processing it. We, we don't even process the phrase that comes next. We just start to nod yes. So very interesting. Here's, a, here's one use of it. We say, uh, work out because you love your body, not because you hate it. But the key use of the word because, in fact, twice in the sentence. So because can be um, a very effective word for us. Now, George Lowenstein is a neuroeconomist, and he coined the term information gap theory. And what he found was if there is a gap between what you know and what you want to know, you're going to take action to fill that gap. If there's a gap between what you know and what you want to know, you will take action to fill that gap. And this dovetails nicely with my journalism training. I, I studied journalism in college and then later became a, a marketer. But uh, when I was in journalism school, they taught us about the five W's and the one H. And five W's and the one H are who, what, where, when, why, and how. And they said, start all of your stories, all of your articles, answering those questions, because those are the answers people want. That's what people want to know, and that will increase readership. People will read. So we can borrow a page out of this in our content marketing. We should use the five W's and the one H. And how can we use it? We can use those words in headlines and subheads, uh, you know, high-read pieces, uh, high pieces of real estate. 
So here we have a quiz, who should you vote for? What makes the difference between online success and failure? Where are the normal single men hiding? When leasing makes sense? Why you shouldn't agonize over when to book your summer vacation and how to navigate the most difficult places for women to travel alone. So who, what, where, when, why, how. Those are in, you know, the, the, they're front loaded in the, in the headlines, they're in key positions, and they trigger that information gap theory. We read how to navigate the most difficult places for women to travel alone and we think, I don't know the answer to that, I want to find out. One word of caution though, just make sure you pay off what you promise. You'll trigger you know, information gap theory. People are going to want to take the action to get the answer. Make sure you give them the answer. We're not talking about clickbait here. Now finally, there was a study that came out of Norway from the BI Norwegian School of Business, and they found that headlines and tweets phrased as questions generated 140% lift in engagement over those that used declarative sentences. So a declarative sentence might be, um, red wine may improve your health. And the question version of that would be something like, can red wine improve your health? Well, the questions are much more engaging. They pull people in. They involve the reader. And as, as a result, they get 140% lift in engagement. So good things to know. All right, let's move on to step number two in our five easy steps for creating brain craving content. Step number two is always opt for easy. And as we talk about easy, what we're really talking about is the, the principle of cognitive fluency. It's something that social scientists talk a lot about. And when they talk about cognitive fluency, what they're really talking about is the fact that we as people prefer things that are easy to think about and easy to understand. We don't simply prefer things that are easy to think about and understand. We actually judge them to be more true and more accurate. And this is important because people want content that they can trust. So having people judge something as more truthful and accurate is a good thing. And also, we feel more confident in our ability to make a decision about something that's cognitively fluent, something that's easy to understand. And this is important to us as content marketers because it's key to our ultimate goal, which is to get action. So as we're talking about making things easy, making things cognitively fluent, when it comes to content marketing, we're actually talking sides of cognitive fluency. We're talking about copy and design because both of those things impact how difficult or how easy it is to understand your message and therefore whether or not people are going to engage with it. So from a copy perspective, when you're writing, use short sentences, use an active voice, not a passive voice, have specific benefits, specifics are always better than generalities, have information chunks to make it easier to understand, and use familiar language. Okay, simply put, make it easy. Sometimes we think, oh, I'm communicating to a B2B audience, or I'm communicating to a highly educated audience. I, I have to use jargon, I have to use industry terms. And you know, the truth of the matter is, make it easy. Use language that's familiar to the, uh, to the target that you're communicating with, to the market that you're communicating with. Don't use 75 cent word when a 25 cent word will do, really. Make it easy. As a matter of fact, there was a study that came out of the University of Amsterdam, and what they found was people view companies more positively if their social media uses a conversational human voice. I mean, at the end of the day, people are people, and conversational, human, easy to understand is a very good thing. So let's take a look at how cognitive fluency can influence your writing. I'm sure some of you, at least, are familiar with uh, the, the Daily Skim. They do a quick recap of uh, the news from the previous day. And let's take a look at this example. This came out right around um, the New York primary. And it starts with the story, which is a single line synopsis. They say, yesterday, New Yorkers were in a voting state of mind. And then they say, remind me why this matters. And then they explain in very simple declarative sentences with easy language. It's, it's clear, simply written. They say, since both parties are having a tough time deciding on a candidate, every state counts. Meanwhile, New York's vote really mattered for the first primary season in a long time. Also, three of the five remaining candidates claimed it as home turf, and no one likes to lose at home. So you get it. Short sentences, not complicated, easy words to understand, and you absorb the information. Now, let's compare that to this article, which is not a good example of cognitive fluency. Here we say, despite a relatively calm 2014 overall, stark and widening global economic and policy divergences provoke Q4 market volatility that may continue in 2015. A strengthening mid-cycle expansion and waning stimulus in the U.S. contrasted with disappointing growth and greater policy easing in other major economies. Ah, there's a lot going on there, right? It's long sentences. It's complicated sentence structures. It's too much. It's hard for the brains to process. And you know what happens when something is hard for the brain to process? We skip it. 
So don't make it hard for the brain to process. Don't encourage the brain to skip. Now you might be thinking, yeah, but Nancy, it's, you know, it's financial copy. Maybe there's an exception for financial copy. Maybe it doesn't need to be cognitively fluent. And if you're thinking that, let me share this study with you. This was a study that was done by a team of researchers from Princeton. And what they did is they looked at the effect of stock names on stock performance. And what they found was that stocks with easier to pronounce names outperformed in the market stocks with harder to pronounce names. Okay, and this held true even after the data was adjusted to allow for company size and, and uh, industry or sector or vertical. So a dollars and cents argument for cognitive fluency. And in fact, there was a University of Texas researcher named Matt McGlone, and he took things a step further. He found that people judged phrases that rhyme to be more true and more accurate than similar phrases that don't rhyme. So for example, here we have Wojanite foes versus Wojanite enemies. Both of these phrases essentially say the same thing. The first one rhymes, the second one doesn't. The first one is the one that people would judge to be the more truthful, more accurate expression. Social scientists refer to this as the rhyme is reason bias, and they believe it comes from the fact that rhyming phrases are easier for our brains to process. So not only do rhyming phrases uh, present as easier to remember, they're also believed to be truer. So I'm not suggesting that you write all of your, your um, content marketing copy as poetry, but a little bit of rhyming isn't such a bad thing. In fact, uh, this is a, a page from our website. We say assess the terrain, trigger the brain, measure the game, you know, that little rhyming triplet. Think about uh, the OJ trial. If the glove doesn't fit, you must acquit. When it rhymes, it's easier to process, and we believe it to be truer. Interesting, huh? All right. Uh, the brain is also drawn to numbers. All right. So here we have 11 benefits of lemon water you didn't know about. So the brain is drawn to numbers, and there's a reason that the, the brain is drawn to numbers, and that is the human brain craves order and it craves ease, and numbers offer both of those things. Numbers promise order, numbers promise ease. So the human brain craves that. Numbers also stand out in a sea of letters. The human brain is hardwired to notice things that stand out. So you're generating all this content, a lot of it is, is copy, so people are skimming and scanning and it's this sea of letters. And then there are these occasional numbers. Well, they stand out in the eyes attracted to them. In fact, social scientists refer to this as the von Restorff effect, which simply holds that the brain sees, notices, and remembers things that stand out, things that are different. Now, some studies have shown that you can get a 36% lift in clicks if your headline happens to have a number in it. There was a Harvard University study that showed odd numbers are, are more believable than rounded numbers. People found, find odd numbers to be more credible. If you say, eh, you know, five minutes, that sounds like you've rounded it up. If, if you say to someone, seven minutes, it sounds like you know exactly what you're talking about. That, that notion of a, a specific number, it's much more credible. The one exception to that might be 10, okay? There's a study that was published in the Journal of Consumer Research, and it found that 10 and multiples of 10 are easier for the brain to categorize. And uh, social scientists believe it's, it's most likely because we grew up counting on our fingers. So 10 and multiples of 10 are believed to be easier for the brain to process. In-market tests have shown that they prompt a two to five time increase in clicks. So that's cognitive fluency from a, a copy perspective. Now let's look at things from a design perspective, because our content needs to look easy to absorb. It needs to look readable. We shouldn't make consuming our content look like a chore. And a poorly designed website will make people think that your product or service is also poorly designed. So we want to avoid that. And densely written copy will also turn people off. So here are some design tips. Avoid lots of reverse type. Okay, reverse type is um, light type on a dark background. It's fine for the occasional headline or the pull quote if you want to just direct some attention and, and uh, get somebody to, to focus on something. But when you start to write your text in reverse type, paragraph after paragraph after paragraph, you will lose about 50% of your readership. Black text on a white background is easiest to read because of the good contrast. You want to keep the contrast to be nice and good and sharp, otherwise it's going to be hard for people to read. You want to keep your line length at about 80 characters for comfortable reading. Use short paragraphs, two to four lines of text, put space in between your paragraphs, and make sure that your point size and your font are readable. These are ways to make sure that, um, that your the work that you design, the content you design, is cognitively fluent. And as we talk about readability, this is an interesting study. Social scientists conducted research, and they found that messages are more persuasive if they're an easy-to-read font. If you find something 
difficult to read, you believe that what you've just read about is difficult to do. So there was a team of researchers in, uh, at the University of Michigan, and they asked people to read about a recipe. And some people read about the recipe in a very easy-to-read typeface. I think it was Ariel. Other people read about it in a very um, ornate, harder-to-read typeface. I believe it was a brush, if I'm not mistaken. The people who read about the recipe in a hard-to-read typeface estimated it would take 59% longer to prepare the recipe than those people who read about it in an easy-to-read typeface. So when we read about something and, and we're having a hard time reading it, we literally believe it's going to be hard for us to do. And in some cases, if we're having a hard time reading it, we won't bother to read it at all. All right, our next slide is not really cognitively fluent, at least not to me. I'm not an equation kind of a person. But I have it in here for a reason. This is the equation for Fitz's Law. It's named for an interaction designer named Paul Fitz. Fitz's Law states that the time required to move to a target is a function of the size of the target and the distance to the target. The size of the target and the distance to the target. So essentially, this is a, a mathematical explanation for why we want to have larger buttons on our landing pages and why we want our calls to action to be above the fold. We want to make it easy to, to get to the target the size of the target and the distance to it. It's all about making it easy for people to do what we want them to do. Now on the flip side of things, we should also make it hard for people to do what we don't want them to do. So take a quick look at this. This is the uh, email that came out from Barack Obama after his State of the Union address. I've, I've truncated it and uh, gotten it onto one slide. There's no need to read it. I, I, I just want to show you how long it is, but I want you to focus on the bottom where people are typically offered the opportunity to, uns to unsubscribe if they want to. And normally, when we allow people to unsubscribe, what do we do? We have a, a single link that simply says unsubscribe. It sits there by itself. It's 11 letters long, and that's that. But look at what they did. They said, click here if you'd like to unsubscribe from these messages. So they went from an 11-letter standalone target to a four-letter target that was embedded inside of a longer sentence. This got them a 22% decrease in unsubscribes, and that's what they were going after. They wanted to uh, decrease the number of people who are unsubscribing. So remember, make it easy for people to do what you want them to do. Make it difficult for them to do what you don't want them to do. Size of the target and distance to it. All right, we're up to step number three of the five steps. And this one is design for the mind's eye. Now, there have been numerous studies that show that the human brain is drawn to images. The reason? It finds them easier to process and remember. In fact, 90% of the information our brains get is visual. So this, of course, has direct implications for our content. Visual content generates 94% more views. Tweets with images get 150% more retweets. Articles with images get twice as many shares. And this is why, with stats like that, uh, that we're all putting visuals along with our content. And it's also why the question today is, scientifically speaking, what are the best visuals to use? Which are the ones that can prompt automatic behaviors? Well, let's take a look at six of them. One of the absolute best things you can do is to use faces. Human beings are hardwired to look at faces, particularly the eyes. We find them irresistible. And social scientists believe this goes way back to our caveman days when we encounter a stranger and we'd have to quickly decide friend or foe, right? Do I fight? Do I, do I flee? What, you know, what's, what's going on here? And in order to quickly decide, we would look at somebody in the face. We would particularly look at their eyes. And now, all these years later, we are still compelled by people's faces. So if you have the opportunity to use faces in your content marketing, do that. Have the, the person look out at your reader or your viewer and make eye contact. It will pull them in. However, if you don't want to do that, there's another thing that you can do, and that is to use the eye gaze to direct your reader's gaze to where you want it to be. Human beings are naturally hardwired to follow another person's gaze. So in this particular example, you can see that the woman is looking at the, the form that we want people to fill out. But she could also be looking at an offer, at a headline, at any critical piece of information. Because when we look at this screen, we automatically follow her eyes. So use, use the eyes to make eye contact or use the eyes to direct somebody else's gaze. Now, there's something else that's very interesting about looking at a person, and that is looking at a person can trigger something called mirror neurons. Mirror neurons were discovered in 1991 by a University of Parma researcher. His name was Giacomo Rizzolatti. And he proved that when we see someone doing something, the neurons in our own brains fire as if we ourselves are having the experience. 
This is why sports psychologists tell you to envision the perfect golf swing or, or the perfect tennis serve. From the brain's perspective, there's really not much difference between reading about an experience, watching the experience, imagining it, or doing it ourselves. They all activate the brain in the same way. So if you see a picture or a video of someone enjoying a product, your brain processes that as if you yourself were enjoying it. And that, of course, makes you want it. So use pictures of people, engage with your product or service, and enjoying it, enjoying your product or service. It will increase people's desire for it. So there was a study that came out of Stockholm University by someone named Kimmo Erickson, a researcher named Kimmo Erickson. And this study found that including an equation with your text makes it more persuasive, even if the equation is irrelevant. It's kind of, kind of interesting, but the study was conducted among a group of people that had either master's or PhD degrees, and they were shown an abstract from a research article. And some people saw the abstract, and it was also accompanied by an irrelevant line of text. Other people saw the exact same abstract, but it was accompanied by an irrelevant equation. Up to 73% of the group that saw the nonsense math, the irrelevant equation, rated what they had just read as more credible. So if you have the opportunity to use an equation, certainly not an irrelevant one, but if you have the opportunity to use an equation, it just provides instant credibility to your content, to your text. Now there was a similar study that came out of Cornell University, and what they found was showing a graph or a chart with your text also increased the credibility. It went from 68% uh, to 97%. So having a graph, a chart, or an equation accompany the text portion of your content can just provide kind of instant gravitas, instant credibility. There was also a study that came out of New Zealand, and it found that text is deemed more credible when it's accompanied by a photo, even when the photo doesn't support the point of the text. Pretty interesting. What they did is they took the statement, turtles are deaf, and they asked people to look at the statement, either with or without a picture of a turtle. And the statement, turtles are deaf, was judged to be more accurate more often when the picture of the turtle was present even though the picture in no way shows you whether or not the darn thing can hear. I mean, you can't tell from looking at this picture whether or not it can hear, but simply having the picture accompanying the statement made people feel that the statement was truer and more believable. So as we're talking about pictures, you might be thinking, well, Nancy, you know, should I be going with color imagery? Should I be going with black and white imagery? You know, what's, what's the best way here? And if you were to ask me that, I would say, well, it may come down to what it is you hope your reader is going to do when they see this. There was a study that came out of PLUS One, and they found that color images are shared more than black and white ones, so that's a good thing to know. However, there was another study, this came out of the University of Ohio, and what they found was black and white images make you focus more on a product's essential features. So what they did is they had a couple of groups of people, and these people were asked to evaluate camping radios. So the first group of people uh, read about a few different camping radios, and each each description was also accompanied by a color photo. The second group of people read about the exact same camping radios, um, but their pictures were in black and white. And what this University of Ohio study found was that uh, people who looked at the black and white pictures of camping radios were about 50% more likely than those who'd seen the color photos to choose a camping radio that was smaller and lighter. And these are, are of course, you know, key features for a camping radio. It seems that the color photos prompted people to focus more on cosmetic or superficial features over the essential ones. So you might want to think about what it is you want to point out in your product, whether you've got a product where the essential features are, are really kind of the selling point or whether the things that you want people to focus on are more the cosmetic, non-essential features. And as you're writing your content and you're choosing your photos to go with it, you choose color or black and white based on that, based on what you want people to focus on, what you want the takeaway to be. All right, we're up to step four of our five steps, and that's tell them the story. The truth of the matter is people learn from stories. Throughout history, particularly before the written, written word, stories were how information was transferred. Like, stories were passed down from generation to generation. And even today, they remain a very powerful way to get your message across. In fact, in his book, Hypnotic Writing, Joe Vitale makes the point that stories allow you to draw your own conclusions. And while we may argue with what someone else tells us, we rarely argue with our own conclusions. Science also tells us that telling a story is a great way to engage people. and There's a real scientific reason for this. And that's because when people read or hear a story, more parts of their brains engage than if they were just reading facts. When people, when people are reading facts and figures, it activates the Broca's and Wernicke's areas of the brain. Those are the two areas where language is processed. 
However, when people are reading a story, other parts of the brain also get involved. It certainly uh, involves Broca's and Wernicke's areas, but other parts of the brain also get involved when people are reading a story. So, for example, if they read about an action, perhaps kicking, it would stimulate the motor cortex. And if they read about a smell, maybe lavender, it, it will activate the olfactory cortex. And if we read a metaphor, like he has leathery hands, the part of the brain that, that processes touch, the sensory cortex, gets activated. And the way this works is because more parts of the brain are involved, people understand the information better and retain it longer. And that's, that's one of the beauties of storytelling. Okay? It involves more parts of the brain. The more parts of the brain that are involved, the better people understand the information and the longer they retain it. All very good things. Now, here's something interesting to note, though. I, I talked about he has leathery hands as an example of something that would um, activate the, the uh, sensory cortex. Researchers also found that some metaphors have become so overused that they've lost this power and they just simply regis register as regular words. They don't activate the, uh, the sensory cortex. For example, what researchers found was the phrase, had a rough day, didn't really do anything in terms of uh, activating the, the part of the brain that deals with touch. We're so used to hearing that it's become so hackneyed, overused actually, that um, it, it doesn't register as anything more than a, than a series of words. It doesn't make you think of, of rough texture. So that's a great argument for keeping your content fresh. So Jonah Berger, who's the author of Contagious, says you can deliver any message. You can deliver any message inside if the Trojan horse or the vehicle of the message is a story. And I thought that was a wonderful analogy. You can deliver any message inside if the Trojan horse or the vehicle of the message happens to be a story. So stories really do invite people in and allow you to convey the information you need to convey. Stories are involving. Even better, social scientists have found that people are hardwired to finish stories. We're really invested and we want to find out how things end. Social scientists refer to this need to finish what we've started as the Zygarnik effect. And once people start something, they want to find out how it ends. So let's look at some ways that we can use storytelling and content marketing. Here, a uh, modern postcard site tells the story of Esther Howland, who's the mother of the Valentine. Or here, JetBlue gives you the opportunity to listen to four customer stories. And uh, for example, if you were to choose the first one, space, you would hear from Ariana Cohen. She's six foot three inches tall, and she talks to you about what it's like for someone that tall, for someone who's six three, to be crammed into an airplane and to have to fly cross country with your knees jammed into the seat in front of you, up against that uh, that uh, seat uh, tray. And then she goes on to explain that she really appreciates the extra leg room at Jet JetBlue. And so you could see how having that information conveyed in her story is so much better than JetBlue just saying, hey, we've got extra leg room, we have more leg room than, than other airlines. Because listen to her story, you've got a mental picture that you're painting of this very tall woman with her, her knees jammed into the seat in front of her and how uncomfortable she is, and it just really helps you remember the, the punchline, if you will, that JetBlue gives you more, uh, more leg room. Now, if you think that listening to stories is powerful, and it is, but if you think that listening to stories is powerful, imagine what happens when you actually write the story. So here's an example where Dove is inviting people to enter a contest where they can upload a video telling their story about why they're ready for their close-up and a special appearance on Dancing with the Stars. So imagine you, know, you, you get this and you think, oh man, I really want to be on Dancing with the Stars. This will be awesome. So I have to talk about you know, how Dove has made me ready for my close-up. So I'm going to have to say something good because if I hope to get chosen, I'm going to have to say something that they like. I'm, you know, they're not going to choose me if I don't say something good. So maybe I, I go on and on about how I, I recommend Dove to my friends and I use it every day. Or maybe I use it three times a day. But you say something good. And then something really interesting happens. According to Dr. Robert Cialdini, who's the author of Influence Science and Practice, people will live up to what they have written down. Once they write something down, or in this case, once they write it and record it, they feel compelled to believe it. And if they don't, if what they've said and what they do happens to be different, it causes something known as cognitive dissonance. And it's a very uncomfortable feeling. It's uncomfortable psychologically. It, it can actually, it could be uncomfortably physically as well. It could be uncomfortable physically as well. You can actually get a pit in your stomach if you're saying one thing and doing another thing. So what happens is once you've said something or, or recorded something, you're going to change your action to match what it is you said you do so that you could 
resolve the cognitive dissonance, and, and both of those things can be in sync. What you say and what you do can be in sync. That's when it feels good. So getting someone to, to write something down, to tell their own story, is a fabulous way to, to trigger this principle. Finally, stories can apparently increase the value of things. There was something known as the significant objects experiment, and this was very cool. The way it worked is a couple of researchers went out to different flea markets and garage sales and, and yard sales, and they bought up a bunch of stuff, right? a bunch of junk, really. Um, and then what they did is they had people write fictional, they had, you know, writers write fictionalized stories about each of these items, and they posted the items along with the fictionalized story on eBay. And it was clear when they posted them that they were not supposed to be true stories. And then they went, you know, they kind of sat back and they, they waited to see what was going to happen. And what happened was people spent way more money on the stuff than it was actually worth. In fact, this was a snow globe, uh, snow globe from Utah. The researchers bought it for 99 cents at a, at a yard sale. They sold it on eBay for $59. So stories can be incredibly powerful. All right, we're, uh, we're coming up to step number five, our final step, and that is add the emotion quotient. Social scientists have found that people make decisions for emotional reasons, and then they later justify those decisions to themselves and to others with rational reasons, which means your content should really have a nice balance of both emotional and rational in it. In fact, there was a neuroscientist, his name is Antonio Damasio, and he actually studied people who sustained injury to the parts of their brains that controlled emotion. What he found was that those people were virtually incapable of making a decision. Because they, they weren't able to, to feel emotion, they, part of their brain that controlled emotion had been damaged, they were virtually incapable of making a decision. So emotion is really critical to your content. Emotion helps people decide. It creates a more lasting impression than, than simply rational thought, and it creates a connection. And this is important because once you create a connection with your readers, you've made them more open to responding to you. Psychologists have a term for it. They call it emotional contagion. But if you can make someone feel something, you can connect with them. If you can make someone feel something, you can connect with them. And once you connect with them, you're in a better position to persuade them to do what you want them to do. As a matter of fact, a study came out of Wharton, Wharton School of Business, uh, and they found that content that prompted high arousal emotions, such as anxiety, awe, wonder, and fear, had the best chances of being shared and going viral. Low arousal emotions, just in case you're wondering, are things like contentment or, or sadness. But high arousal emotions like anxiety, awe, wonder, fear, these are the things that people were sharing and, and things that were actually going vi viral. Then there was a study that came out of Outbrain, and they found that negative superlative headlines, in other words, headlines with words like worst in them, outperformed those with positive superlatives by 69%. So in this particular example, we have the best and worst birth control option. So we've got both ends of the spectrum covered. However, if, if you had to choose between two articles, and one article was best birth control options, and the other was worst birth control options, chances are you'd go for worst birth control options because you don't want to make a mistake, right? I mean, the best are good to know about, but you really want to avoid the worst. And that actually leads us nicely into this next section. I want to share with you three emotionally charged psychological shortcuts that you can use in content, okay? Because emotion is very powerful, but we're also talking about the, the automatic actions and the psychological shortcuts. So I want to show you three that you can use. The first is something known as loss aversion. It, it, it kind of goes along with that best and worst, worst uh, birth control options. But Social scientists have found that people are twice as motivated to avoid pain as they are to achieve gain. Okay, this is what loss aversion is all about. We're more motivated to avoid pain than to achieve gain. So if we're playing the slot machine and we win $50, maybe on a scale of 1 to 10, that ranks as a positive 5. If we lost that same $50 on that same scale, it would rank not as a negative 5, but as a negative 10. We're twice as motivated to avoid pain as we are to achieve gain or pleasure. Now this may seem a little counterintuitive to us as content marketers in that we always want to offer information that's positive, that's helpful, that puts our, our company or our product or our service in the best light. And I'm, I'm not suggesting you don't do that. In fact, it's, it's a very good thing to be positive and helpful and to position ourselves well. But a little well-placed loss aversion is also a good thing. So if you tell people what they'll miss if they don't read your content, that can be very powerful. If you tell them the horrible thing they can avoid by reading your content, the thing that they'll, you know, they'll find out when they read your content, that's a good thing. Essentially, you want to evoke the emotions of fear, anxiety, as well as the feeling of self-protection. So let's take a look at a few examples. Here we have the biggest mistake most companies make during a website redesign, 
and how to fix it. And what's nice here, what's important here, as a matter of fact, is that they're not only triggering the anxiety, but they're also providing the solution. That's what makes this approach so effective. Well, here's another example of loss aversion. It's, it's um, using gated content. If you, if you offer gated content, the reader doesn't, if the reader doesn't sign up, they don't get in. They lose out. And that's a great way to, to uh, trigger loss aversion. Now, another decision-making shortcut that's emotionally charged is social proof. And what social scientists have found is that when people are uncertain of what to do, they look to others and they follow their lead. And this is particularly true if others are similar to them. In fact, there were a couple of researchers that went door to door in South Carolina and they were posing uh, as uh, collectors for a fictitious charity. And uh, they would ask people, they would describe the charity and of course people hadn't heard of it because it was fictitious. And then what they would do is they would show people a list of everyone else in the area they had already donated. And what they found was the longer that list was, the more likely the person in front of them would be to donate. Because you're standing there, you don't know the guys or, or the, the researchers, the people, you don't know the cause because it doesn't exist and you're wondering, well, what do I do? And if there are a lot of people that already made a donation, you took the decision-making shortcut and made the donation. If there were very few names on that list, the decision-making shortcut led you to not not make the donation. So essentially we do what people like us do because we have this hardwired des uh, desire to conform. It gives us a sense of belonging and it makes us feel secure, it makes us feel confident. So those are the emotions we want to get at. So how do we use social proof in content marketing? Well one of the easiest ways is customer testimonials. And I'm sure you know that a good testimonial comes from someone who's similar to the person you're trying to convince. The best testimonials start exactly where that prospect is, that person you're trying to convince. And where that prospect is, is a place of skepticism. They're a little bit hesitant. So look at this example from HealthWorks. They say, I took my first burn class yesterday and I was very impressed. I was a little skeptical at first, wondering if it would really be worth the additional cost. It was a great workout though and definitely work, worth it. So it's interesting, you, you know, you, you, you think to yourself, look, I'm at the gym, I've already paid for the gym membership, is it, is it worth spending the extra money to take this class? And then you read that testimonial and you think, oh my God, that's exactly what I was thinking, but this person has already done it and they think it's good, therefore I will. So a great way to use social proof. Similarly, headlines that reveal something is the most popular, the fastest growing, the most often purchased, the most often inquired about, these also do a great job of leveraging social proof. And our last example is the principle of scarcity. And what social scientists have found is if something's not readily available, if we're interested, we take advantage. If we're not interested, we don't. But just let that something change. Just suddenly say it's only available for a certain amount of time or it's only available to a certain group of people and that makes us want it and want it badly. We really put great value on things that are scarce. In fact, in North Carolina, they did a uh, experiment where people were asked to rate chocolate chip cookies, but some people took a cookie from a glass jar that had 10 cookies. Others took a, a cookie from a glass jar that had only two cookies. The people who took the cookie from the jar that only had two cookies rated it as the more favorable. They said it was more desirable to eat, more attractive as a consumer item, and it was more costly. Why? Because they took one of only two cookies, it was a scarce thing, and people place greater value on things that are scarce. So there are two halves to the scarcity principle. Urgency, only available for a limited time and, uh, or a limited amount, and exclusivity, only available to a, a certain group of people. And urgency can prompt feelings of anxiety and longing. Exclusivity can make people feel pride and joy. So how do we use it in content marketing? Well, here we have, uh, for just a very limited time, you can enroll in this marketing program. So that's got the urgency going for it. Or here we have warning, space is limited to a thousand registrants and the advanced, uh, the advanced webinars always fill up fast. So that's really kind of highlighting the, the urgency end of things. In terms of exclusivity, here we have Chris Penn who reminds readers of his premium content that it's reserved for people like you who have taken the time and effort to complete their newsletter registration. And then he asked people to not share the content, to further underscore how exclusive it is. And in this last example, we have um, Neil Patel, and he's offering one-year access to his private Facebook group. And you think, wow, that's, that's pretty exclusive. I'm going to get into something that's private that not everyone can get in. So to recap, if, if we want to create brain-craving content, we need to remember that the brain makes automatic decisions. And so simply writing really good content is now no longer enough to guarantee it will be concerned. We have to write the really good content, but we also have to do the things that are going to trigger some of these automatic decisions. So what we want to do is remember that some words are worth more than others, always opt for easy, design for the mind's eye, tell them the story, and add the emotion quotient. 
And if anybody is interested in a cheat sheet that recaps all of the content that we just covered, certainly shoot me an email. I'd be happy to shoot you the, the PDF. And I want to thank you for spending this time with me. And uh, also, I'm willing to entertain any questions that might have come up. Fantastic. Nancy, really great, great job with the presentation today. Matter of fact, I want to thank you for the several hundred hours worth of uh, neuromarketing research that you put into this presentation. My, my goodness, I'm, uh, I've, I've read quite a bit myself, and there's some new studies and new data here, and there's really exciting. Thanks again for all of that. Oh, you're very welcome. It's fascinating stuff, isn't it? It sure is. Let's go to some questions. Um, Stephen had a great question. Doesn't free send up red flags to readers like what's the catch sort of reflex? So, Stephen, that is a fabulous question. And um, free is, it, it's interesting, it's a mixed bag. So on the one hand, um, it, it can make people wonder, well, if, if it's free, maybe it's really not going to be worth anything, but that's a more thoughtful um, kind of approach to the word, and on a very automatic, instinctive gut level, we're attracted to, to free. We, we just, we're attracted to free things, things that we, would, you know, we wouldn't pay for, we wouldn't go out of our way to get if we, if we had to buy them, but if they're free, we, we gravitate towards them. Think about the conferences you go to and the bag of junk that you bring back home, and you're like, oh my god, I collected all this stuff, why? This stuff, and that's just one small example. However, what I want to do is I want to add something to this and say a great way to compensate for what it is you're, you're worried about, Stephen, is to put the value, perhaps in parens next to, uh, to your offer, uh, and say, you know, you, you can have this for free. It's normally, you know, a $471 value. So people understand, oh, all right, there really is a value associated with this, and to maybe even put a time limit on it, that it's free for you now but it won't always be. So that can help help offset uh, somebody who might be giving it a little bit more thought than just uh, going with their gut response. Great, great answer, Nancy. Hit your back button for a couple of, couple of slides. That last slide you showed was a really interesting example. Um, right there, yeah. So notice the, I love the, the you know, one year access to my private Facebook group. Um, awesome stuff goes down, you know, they have a conversational tone and style, but then kerplunk, I want you to be part of it. Why not? You need to be part of it. I was looking at that saying, geez, this person needs to look at your course. Can, do, you, do you firmly believe in, in the testing you've done yourself, using the word you uh, outpowers I like a million to one? Would you agree with that? And could you just comment on that one more time? Yeah, I really do. You know, there, the, the benefit of I I believe is that you know people think okay it feels more personal it feels more one to one, but you know when you look at research that's been done with uh, with eye tracking and um, you know heat mapping, people kind of just avoid the word I. They they really are drawn to the word you. And as I said, it's impossible to write everything to construct all of your content without ever using the word I. You're, you're going to, to need to use it. But I really do believe that people are more interested in themselves and you know they're 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 drawn to their names, and if you're not going to have their name, that the next best substitute is the word you. Mm -hmm. Jacqueline has a great question. When using images of people, what do you think of the theory that people want to see images of people who look like them, age, gender, race, etc.? Yeah, that's a that's a great question, Jacqueline. And a lot of my clients will uh, will bring that up and say, "Oh, we you know we're hesitant to show people because we don't want someone to use the picture as an excuse to say, oh, this this isn't for me.'" And there's there's certainly something to using photos to telegraph, um, you know, the the target that you're trying to uh, to reach or to attract. But then there's the just the overarching appeal that, that photos have. And uh, so one way to perhaps get around the, oh, I don't want to show one person because that one person may not represent the, the right age, gender, race, you know, whatever, is to show a group of people. Uh, as a matter of fact, people actually find groups of people to be, in aggregate, more attractive than any single person. So that could be one way to uh, to get around it. And then, of course, I think you do need to, to you know, balance your... Uh, you know, your need to convey the right information to the target you're, you're writing to, that you're creating content for, with the, the automatic interest that showing a face will get for you. And, and one way to do that, of course, is to test and to see, you know, does 
one kind of a, a visual or a graphic work better than another, but certainly I would suggest testing faces because the eyes uh, automatically go to them. Humans are just attracted to, to other humans. Hmm. Thanks in advance. Keith, great question here. Interesting detail, detail on how color photos versus black and white. Uh, thoughts on how a big how big a role color theory can play into an image like blue calming warm colors might convey hunger you know do you see correlation in, in, in any of your neuromarketing research have you discovered any patterns with colors uh, in photos oh absolutely in fact uh, we, we do an entire entire session on that and, and um, you're absolutely right you know blue is considered to be calming and green sometimes suggests refreshing and uh, I think green is uh, if I'm not mistaken the easiest color for the brain to absorb yellow actually stimulates the the brain's excitement center red can speed up your heartbeat uh, a lot of a lot of times fast food restaurants use red because they just want to get people in and out quickly so yes there's a, there's a lot that you can do with color and a lot you can convey with color just to, to set an overall tone or mood um, it, it, you know it, it also has implications for your brand for that matter. Let's see. In your opinion, does the length of the title matter? I have always kept it short and simple. Thanks, Sue. So, um, I think it depends on the uh, it depends on the context. Um, you know, certainly if you're if you're advertising your content via email, you want to keep those subject lines incredibly short because they get truncated. But then if you're just talking about the the content title, um, you know, I, I think I'm going to give you that that legal answer. Use as many words as you need to use to convey the information. Uh, you know, I don't want to say. Uh, without fail, shorter is always better because people aren't reading. Because that's not necessarily true. People will read what interests them, but um, there's there's something to be said for conveying what you need to convey in the most succinct way possible. So I think if you've always tried to keep things short, you're probably on the right track. Hmm. Here's a question from Lisa: In choosing images for professional services, say law, are there are, are there alternatives to the scales of justice? and attorneys pondering documents that firm management would go for? I, I love that question, Lisa, particularly the last part of the question, which is really the essence of it. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, because, yeah, I mean, you're, there have been a, a few studies out there that I've come across that, that indicate that the typical stock photography just doesn't resonate with people. And I think what you just described is kind of the typical stock photography for the legal profession. and. Um, you know, so then you're you're tasked with trying to find something else that people will find appealing, but that you can also get through uh, upper management, if you will, and uh, it's going to require a little bit more work, certainly. But I would I would say to keep trying and to keep testing to see if you can uh, land on something that will work, because pictures can be very powerful, but if everyone is using the same picture, it, it starts to uh, it well it certainly doesn't help you differentiate your content and it starts to become like wallpaper to, um, to to the consumers of the content. I'm a big fan of metaphors, Nancy. I've actually had a few speaking engagements focused on just metaphors alone. Do you agree that you know to, to, to characterize a person, place, or thing, it, it helps to use metaphors and do you see that be effective with, with your testing and, and content you're creating for, for your clients? I have it on good authority from uh, Byron White, actually, that it is. <laughs> <laughs> so yes, I do not disagree with you there. Yeah, yeah. In, in your reading of neuroscience, I mean, that, that, that's a big deal, of course, with, with many of the neuroscience specialists out there, and, and particularly in the, in the representation and, and the way to connect with the brain very quickly and succinctly. Um, you know, what's your take on that? Do you think that it's worthy of it, if it's of adding a sixth dimension? Is it that worthy in your mind, or do you think it, it's just a you know, it's just really uh, something that is more personalized to to the storyteller or or, or the content creator? So I think it, I think it does a couple of things. Uh, you know, we, we mentioned metaphors just briefly uh, in the, in the session and how a metaphor can activate a different part of your brain other than the the two parts of your brain that simply process words and language so in and of itself that I mean there alone I guess you could say is the the best um, reason to use metaphors because the more parts of the brain that get involved the better you understand the information and the more you remember it um, but then there's also I think a dimension of accessibility particularly if you might be trying to um, convey a, a concept that's a little bit 
harder for people to grasp, and so you find the appropriate metaphor, and suddenly it becomes accessible to people. They understand it. Um, they, uh, you know, just it's it's almost like a a light gets turned on, and and suddenly people That's feel right. feel good about what they've just read. Exactly. So I think. Um, you know, in terms of memorability, in terms of understanding, and uh, and then almost you know the the word version of the Lisa question from a, a few minutes ago. If you if you can find a fresh way of conveying information, suddenly you know you become the person who owns that information and it's associated with your brand, and it doesn't become uh, you know uh, copy wallpaper, if you will. Uh, two quick questions. Somebody wants you to go back to your summary page for a second so they can take some, some, some notes very quickly. Um, while you're going there, I'll read another question. I will make only one quick comment on the metaphor. I just can't leave metaphors alone. <laughs> right? um, you know, basically, as you described it today, emotional thinking is you know, fast and effort, effortless and unconscious and, and almost intuitive, right? Um, whereas rational thinking is slow and deliberate and thought out you know, with reasoning. You know, as it turns out, metaphors bypass the rational and they in, 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 in the critical thinking and they connect to your deeper more intuitive mind right so I think the metaphors part fits with your always opt for easy and mm -hmm. I would ask everyone to think about that today uh, but Keith has a really cool question was surprised to learn about odd numbers um, that to learn odd numbers seem more legit than even numbers are there certain numbers to try to shoot for and avoid when making lists I know you said 10 was an important one. Of course, that's even in the exception. But literally, is it as granular as certain odd numbers or odder than others, and you shouldn't use them? <laughs> so, well, it's funny. The, the odd number thing extends to, um, to a lot of uh, different circumstances. One certainly would be lists. And I think if you had um, 13 reasons or seven mm. reasons or nine reasons, those are, um, you know, those just stand out a little Safe bit. Safe and digestible, but, yeah. Yeah, you know, and then odd numbers are also. Uh, I had a great example. I didn't include it in this um, in this presentation, but I had been on a website and I wanted to buy something, and they said it was uh, reserved by others, but I should check back in twelve minutes. And you know, it didn't say ten minutes, and they didn't say fifteen minutes. They said twelve minutes, and there was something about that twelve that made me think. All right, they know what they're doing. They've calculated this, and in exactly 12 minutes, which, by the way, is an even number, not an odd number, but it's odd in the context of, um, it, in 12 minutes, maybe one of these handbags that I'm interested in will become available. And you know, so you could round up to you know to 15 minutes or round down to 10, but the 12 just had a certain credibility to it. So that's another example. Or you know, sometimes in um, uh, you know, in, in fundraising, they'll ask people to make a particular donation and say, you know, to, to, to feed a child for a day will cost uh, $12.71. And that's because it's an odd number as opposed to 13, which is an odd number, but it's, but it's a rounded number, if you will, uh, that, that precision gives it more credibility. So, um, so it's not that I can say to you there are certain magic numbers that you should always shoot for, but it's just within the context, the way people think about it is, if it seems very specific, there's a certain amount of credibility that rides along with it. And if it seems like it was just kind of thrown out like uh, more of a common rounded up number, it loses the ability to communicate that, that specificity and credibility. Do you have a sense, Nancy, and I don't have an answer to this question, but hopefully you might, um, you know, when neuromarketing first sort of emerged to the mainstream back in 2002, it was sort of bridging the gap between buyer behavior with neuroscience, right? So, um, and, and, and obviously the immediate fork in the road between emotional thinking and rational thinking were the devices that we use to sort of analyze this buyer behavior process. These two processes, of course, you know, guide the purchasing decision, but the mix is different with each person, and that's what a lot of people don't really understand. People look to neuromarketing to say, "Okay, this is it. Let's we've you've cracked the code. Tell me how this all works." But the problem is, it's a different mix with each person, and you really need to understand a deeper layer with who is the uh, who is the who is the client that you're creating content for, right? What is the general mix of the personalities? Almost, almost like, a, can you ever imagine, for example? A, a persona driven by neuroscience, right, or neuromarketing, right, where you're not just looking at three behavior pa patterns of, uh, not, not even behavior patterns, but of, of characteristics of, of, of the demographic of your target audience, but instead the mix of the rational versus emotional thinking and how people respond to testing, for example. Could you imagine personas built that way in the future? 
Yeah, I, I think you know, we, we might be able to get there. I think a lot of the things that we talked about today are uh, you know, applicable across the board, but but to your point, yeah. the question is to what degree? And mm -hmm. you know, there might be some people who are more susceptible to social proof, others that are more susceptible to loss aversion. That might vary based on the scenario that they're in. It might vary based on the life stage that they're in. And so, I, I think that we might be able to get there. Yes, with uh, mm -hmm. particularly with uh, you know, fueled by all the data that we're uh, you know that we have access to these days. Well, I'm going to invite you to a to a podcast, uh, and, and if you if you will be nice enough to have us, because I've got another 25 questions myself that I'd like to ask you, Nancy. Um, so let's carry on this conversation for anybody that's interested. Uh, it, it's surprisingly most people that have been on this webinar have been listening to these extra minutes here. So that tells me that you've got a lot of knowledge to share, Nancy. We really appreciate you being with us today. Well, thank you very much. I really appreciated the opportunity. Right on. Look forward to the next with you, Nancy, and thanks for tuning in, everyone.